So let's get to our first presentation. I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Barentine. Dr. Barentine is a professionally trained astronomer and the executive officer and principal consultant at Dark Sky Consulting, a company offering professional services in the areas of light pollution, dark skies, and astronomy. Many remember Dr. Barentine for his influential work as the manager of the International Dark Sky Places Program and director of public policy for the International Dark Sky Association, or IDA. He is a committee member of many dark sky and astronomical organizations. And he recently authored a report for IDA called Artificial Light at Night, State of the Science 2022, which we highly recommend you take a look at and we'll put a link to that report in the chat. We're excited to have Dr. Barentine introduce the topic of light pollution for our program today. Um, and as a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of the four presentations. So please type your questions in the Q&A section at any time. Welcome, Dr. Barentine. Please go ahead and share your screen and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Annie, for that lovely introduction. I'll go ahead and begin my slide presentation. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate today. Thank you for uh, to Assemblymember Lee for his advocacy on this issue and leadership in California. Um, and what I will speak to you about over the next about 25 minutes is an introduction to the broader problem that we'll be talking about today. And we'll increasingly narrow that down to the issue of, of birds and the conservation concerns that are associated with it. So I'm going to start and give you sort of the 30,000 foot view of the issue, as it were, um, with an, a specific focus on cities, because a lot of the problem that we're experiencing with light pollution, um, especially here in the West, is really traceable ultimately to our cities, but they're also the solutions to the problem are to be found there. So just as a, a brief overview of my presentation, I'm going to talk to you about that big picture put this in context, uh, what the problem means in a global sense, and then narrow it down to our cities and talk about their reach. So how is it that the case that a, a city can influence uh, the conservation status of a species that may be hundreds of miles away, for example? I'll also talk about the role of cities in not only creating this problem, but potentially solving it. If we kind of rethink the way that we light our cities with newer urban lighting design, um, how we can get a good outcome from this so it's not all just doom and gloom. And I'll summarize that with a vision for the future. What could our cities be like in a way that they would contribute positively towards solving this problem while retaining all the light that we need at night for the many various human activities um, that have become indispensable to our society? So first of all, what is the big picture? Um, you're going to hear this term that Assemblymember Lee used throughout my presentation and others uh, which is artificial light at night. So I figured it was a good place to start with um, a, an explanation of this and a bit of a definition. So the, the words sort of suggest what we're talking about here. Artificial in the sense that this is light that's caused by human activities in one way or another. Um, it's light, so it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, and it's happening at night. So it's when we don't have the dominant natural source of light in our environment, which is sunlight, uh, and in, in that case, there would be other natural sources in the environment, but we are supplanting that with our own light emissions. And broadly speaking, Allen, this artificial light at night, falls into two categories. There's an outdoor version that's suggested by the picture of the New York City skyline at top right. Um, that's mainly what the focus of my talk will be. There's also an indoor version of it. Increasingly, we're hearing about this, especially as it has to do with concerns about human health. Uh, exposure to light at night seems to be bad for people in many respects, uh, but that's a subject of another talk and today I'll be focused on the outdoor Allen. So what can I tell you about um, Allen in general? One thing that I can tell you is that it is an increasingly global phenomenon. This is an image of the earth at night uh, that is produced by NASA and is called the black marble. And it was produced over the course of a year using satellite images of the Earth while the satellites were on the night side. And they stitched together this panorama of the Earth from many thousands of individual images that were all taken under conditions where locally there were no clouds. So it looks like it's night everywhere at once and that there is no weather on the Earth so that we can see the night lights. 
the continents are outlined pretty distinctly from the oceans, which are darker. The continents are sort of bluish from moonlight during the steady period. And what really dominates this view besides the continents is that sort of golden glow, which is the Earth's cities. That's all light caused by human beings that is being emitted into the nighttime environment, some of which goes directly up into the sky where it is detected by uh, Earth orbiting satellites. So this is not um, a phenomenon merely of the West or of developed countries in particular, although you can see areas like North America and Europe and Japan light up very brightly. Uh, developing economies like China and India are rapidly showing up on this map, um, but it's not just a map of where the people live. For example, I can guarantee you that in sub-Saharan Africa near the center of the image, uh, that's where about a billion people live, and yet their part of the world is not brightly lit compared to others, which has something to do with the development level. So even though um, there are certain areas where there are very few people and we don't see a lot of indications of light, um, this really is a global phenomenon now, and it has certain consequences. I can also tell you that Alan is unnatural, which is sort of implied by the word artificial in the acronym. But to really drive this point home, what I'm showing you here on the left are a series of spectra where we have taken light sources and used uh, prisms, for example, to disperse the light into the colors of the rainbow. And I'm giving you spectra of various light sources, starting with a very natural one, which is sunlight up the top and stepping through different kinds of human caused light that you see labeled on the right. And the sunlight spectrum is a more or less what we would call continuous spectrum. So Essentially, all the colors of the rainbow are represented there in certain proportions. And you'll notice that as you step down through those different light sources, their spectra or the colors that they're emitting are increasingly unlike uh, sunlight to the point that if we're talking about uh, LED lighting or fluorescent lighting, the spectra of those sources looks very different than sunlight. And that has important biological implications because our biology developed in a world in which these artificial sources did not exist, much less uh, emitting light at night. So from that perspective, the impact that we see on biological systems is very significant. And it in part traces back to this idea that the color of that light and the timing of its emission into the environment is distinctly unnatural. I can also tell you that the use of artificial light at night across the world is really growing out of control right now. This is probably the most technical slide that I'm gonna show you and it requires a little bit of, of explanation. This is the result of a study that was done in the first half of the last decade using that map of the world that I showed you previously where the researchers looked at each country's share of that light emission and they looked at two quantities. The one I'm showing you on the left called area is the percentage of that country's land mass that shows some indication of artificial light at night. And then on the right, I'm showing you a quantity called radiance, which is the quantity of light emitted by each country. And the color coding here is showing you how those quantities changed over the course of the study period, which was from 2012 to 2016. So if a country shows up in a red color, it means that quantity was generally increasing by some amount during the study period. And the cooler colors, the, the grays and blues, are where it appeared to decrease. And you'll notice two things. One is that there are very few countries in which the quantities were decreasing, where uh, the lit area on the left was decreasing during the study period, particularly in countries like Syria and Yemen. That was due to civil wars that were ongoing at the time. So this is telling us a bit about human activities. Um, but you'll notice that also the majority of the countries in both of these quantities, they're reds and yellows. They're increasing, generally speaking. And both of these quantities, both the lit area and the radiance, were increasing in this study period on a global average of about 2% per year. So about twice the rate of the human population growth during that time. But some of these countries saw increases during the study period in the double digits of percentages year on year. So this is a really significant issue that's increasing right now at a rate that vastly exceeds the rate at which our human population is growing. So that has a consequence associated with it that you will also hear in a term called light pollution. There's no one definition of this uh, term, but here's one that I like, 
which focuses on adverse effects or impacts that are attributable to the use of artificial light at night. And I say adverse effect or impact in order to distinguish this from useful light that's performing some service for us on the ground. It's lighting our way at night. It's showing us potential obstacles in the way. Um, it's helping us um, be more safe and secure at night. But there are many instances where that light is not reaching its intended target or it's being broadcast into the environment when it's not needed. And when we add up all of those effects, it creates what we call light pollution, which has analogs in the environmental world to other forms of natural pollution. So a way of thinking about it is that it's, it's polluting a resource, which is natural darkness at night. And there are consequences um, when we do that. So what do we know about light pollution besides some of the, the graphics that I've shown you up to this point? We kind of got an impression from the map, perhaps I showed you, that quite a few people in the world live in places that are light pollution. An example of uh, an environmental effect that we can attribute to uh, light pollution is something called sky glow, which is what brightens the night sky and makes it difficult to see the stars beyond. The visibility of the Milky Way is an indicator of a, what we would call a dark sky, which is relatively free of light pollution, but about a third of people live in places that they cannot see the Milky Way at night and under any circumstances. And the interesting factoid here, I think is the last one that almost 90% of Europeans and more than half of the US population experience a perpetual twilight. So it's the sky never drops below a brightness that you would experience in the hours around dusk and dawn when there's still some influence of sunlight uh, in the atmosphere. And that's really just a profound change to the nighttime environment that really has no historical uh, precedent. And you're gonna hear more from the other speakers today about uh, the biological impacts in particular. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that has us most concerned. So ultimately, why is this happening? Why do we have a problem associated with light pollution? It really comes down to an overuse relative to what our needs are. And that overuse is a result of a, a wasteful mindset and how we use a lot of natural resources, not just artificial light at night. And I think that that sense of wastefulness uh, arises from the fact that there's just a lack of awareness. A lot of people don't think that light at night could be a bad thing. They think of it as a, a social good, as something that's beneficial to society. And they don't give a lot of thought to what other effects it might be having on the nighttime environment. So this is already beginning to suggest what the solution to this problem will be, which is by changing the relationship that we have to light at night. Um, but we can start to turn this around and begin to improve the nighttime environment by reducing light pollution while keeping all the light on the ground that we really do need. And at the end of the day, as, for as much as been made of the environmental benefits of LED lighting, I can tell you that this is making the problem worse. It has made light cheaper and easier to consume. And a result of that is that there's more of it now in the environment that there was before the LED revolution began a little over a decade ago. And a lot of that light has the kind of characteristics that are among the very worst for the nighttime environment. So we have to balance the notion that LED is good from an energy efficiency perspective, which it is, with the fact that it's enabling people to use more light in many cases where it's not even needed. So where do cities come into this? I've kind of suggested that cities are part of the problem by some of the images that I've been showing you in the background. Um, and they, they are part of the problem. And it, the reason why is that they really have an outsized influence. Alan really defines our cities at night. Here's an image of the Bay Area that was made by an astronaut aboard the International Space Station a few years ago looking down. They see our cities very brightly uh, and it's easy for them to take still photographs out of the windows. You can see here that the city streets are pretty well defined by where the street lighting is. You can see highways. You see variations in color that are associated with different kinds of land uses. They're using different illumination sources at night. Really, this is the defining characteristic of our cities. And it would be one thing if that light stayed where it is emitted, but it travels very far away from the source. And that again has to do with the, the lack of control and the waste that's associated with what we call light pollution. So and as an example of exactly how far away that light can go, 
Here's some data from a U.S. National Park Service study that was done a few years ago looking at the city of Las Vegas in Nevada. Uh, and as, as many of you know, uh, the, the famous uh, tourism slogan of Las Vegas is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But I can tell you that the one thing that does not stay in Vegas is its light at night. These are some measurements, which are the uh, X's and O's overlaid with a solid line that is the model that they used in this case where they looked at the light at the top of the sky, so what we call the zenith, as a function of the distance away from Las Vegas city center. That's on the, the horizontal axis. And what this shows is that if you uh, compare the amount of light in the night sky to what would be there using, uh, if there were only natural sources, this so-called all sky light pollution ratio that there is on the vertical axis, that there is still more than 1% artificial light in the night sky when you are at a distance of over 250 kilometers from the center of Vegas. So if you think about what sort of, of, of land area is affected by the light of Vegas, it's a footprint that's more than 100,000 square miles in size. So these cities are having this outsized effect on territory that's very far from their own. Uh, and again, if we're concerned about birds, for example, on migratory flyways that are seeing lights in the distance and are being drawn away from those routes, cities are really the core of this problem in many respects. So dense populations that are associated with cities generally mean higher light emissions. Here's a little cutout of uh, the map that I showed you earlier of the Earth at night where you can begin to pick out, for example, the major European capitals that are very evident, but you see the smaller cities in the surrounding countryside. And again, with the reach of that light being so far away from those cities and towns, you have to go very far now to try to find natural darkness. For example, if you wanted to see the Milky Way. I'm next gonna show you an overlay that takes that same idea as before, that ratio in this previous slide of the amount of light you actually see in the night sky to the natural background and it color codes it. And what I mean to show you here with this example is that in some places, and in fact, in, in parts of Europe in many places, that natural nighttime darkness is already gone. So in the map now, that ratio is the false colors and it ranges from out over the oceans where there's essentially no artificial light at night at all to the cores of the bigger European cities where the ratio is in the dozens or even hundreds of times above the natural background. And you'll notice that across most of Central and Western Europe, there just aren't a lot of those blues and grays. You have to go quite a distance away from the cities to find areas where you could see a naturally dark sky. Now, despite this loss that's been caused by lighting from cities, there is a lot here that is recoverable. And that's the next step is talking about um, what can we do? And the built environment is really key in coming to those solutions. We want to target the useful light in this diagram. We wanna put the light where it's needed at night, keep it away from the areas that it's not, get the timing of the light correct so it's there when people need it, it's reduced or extinguished when they're not. And we're reducing these other unfortunate side effects that I labeled light pollution, which includes all of this so-called spill light, light trespassing into buildings and, and into places where it's not wanted. And some of that is the direct upward light in the upper part of this diagram. That's the light that becomes sky glow and makes it difficult to see the stars at night. So what about cities is specifically contributing to this problem? Well, fundamentally, we don't like the world very well. Um, here's an image of the outskirts of Paris, France. It's seen from um, an airplane, so looking above the city. And you'll notice that there's an awful lot of light in this image, which means that that light is directed up towards the viewer and not down necessarily down towards the ground where it is needed. But I would argue that we didn't set out to light the world like this. It is the result of choices that have built up over many decades in uh, parallel with the development of um, urban planning ethics during that time. And that by changing the way that we think about light at night and how we use it, we could see cities of the future that don't really resemble this anymore and are better lit for both humans and the wildlife that inhabits these areas. 
Uh, one of the problems, obviously, with dense uh, urban cores is that we have multi-story buildings that are emitting a lot of light at night through their windows. And by simply shutting off lights inside these buildings, we would make the world a safer place for birds and other species that are confused by this light uh, and ultimately collide with these windows. So that's one point of leverage that we have is that we could do lights out programs or you know, other approaches to sort of mitigate this light that we're putting into the urban environment that's coming from high rise buildings. There's a lot of so-called historical lighting in cities, especially in downtowns. And that those fixtures were made decades or a century or more ago under the presumption that it was probably a gas flame that was inside those light fixtures. They've been replaced with LEDs, which are vastly brighter. But the way that the light is emerging from the fixtures doesn't put a lot of it on the ground where it's needed. So we then need supplemental light. We use, use even more light than we did before. Um, and we're making light pollution worse as a consequence. So we may have to rethink some of these ideas about how we do historic preservation in order to maintain the daytime appearance of these fixtures while limiting their uh, contribution to light pollution at night. And of course, who hasn't seen a news story like this somewhere, right? You know, tired of crime, neighbors light up their streets. And maybe this is not exactly what we want, even though we can acknowledge that, uh, you know, there is a nexus between light at night and safety, and we certainly want to promote that, but there are diminishing returns. And if we're just shining bright light into people's faces at night, we're not necessarily going to improve the situation with uh, crime or public safety. I can tell you that there is some research that says that light levels at night correlate with a feeling of safety, which is important. We want people to feel reassured when they're outside at night. But that's also a case of diminishing returns. And according to this data from a study that was done in Israel a few years ago, you get a strong increase in a feeling of safety when you take a completely dark area and you add a little bit of light to it. But as you add more and more and more light, you don't get the same return on that investment and you don't get people feeling safer about being in those spaces at night. So it's about better design and just not more light in order to make our streets safe and to have people feel safe being on those streets at night. And the other problem that works against us in cities is that the lighting standards that we use are often not really well backed by uh, empirical evidence. Um, and that's, you know, here some leading lighting researchers are saying that out loud in their papers that, that the recommendations we have right now are really not well founded in evidence. Um, and that we need to go out and figure out what the right light levels are in order to light our cities correctly. So lastly, in the, the few minutes I have here remaining, I'm going to wrap up with a vision for the future of what our cities could be in a way that would make light better for people at night on the ground and keep more of that light out of the night sky where it's disorienting to birds and makes it difficult to see the stars. So for one thing, we need to get the right lighting in place. And that is taking into account all of these characteristics of lighting when we make decisions about street lighting, about area lighting in places like parking lots. We need to shield lights properly so that light is kept on the ground. We need to get the color of the lighting right, which is better for our biology. We need to reduce the intensity of that light to proper levels. Um, and finally, get the timing right so that the light is there when people need it and it's reduced or it's switched off completely when people aren't around. In my view, we would have lighting become a core part of urban planning and design and not an afterthought, which it often is. Uh, engineers try to light streets according to whatever the standards are, but there's oftentimes light going in every direction in a, a downtown situation. Um, this is an image of, of my hometown of Tucson, Arizona, where I think we do it really well. Um, and our situation with crime and public safety during the overnight hours is no better or worse than any other American city, to be quite honest. So we've done it in a way that, that really prioritizes um, putting the, the planning and design piece first and putting lighting up front in that process and not leaving it to the very end of a project. And I think we have a very nicely lit city as a result. Um, in the same way that I think we could all agree that the smoke coming out of these smokestacks is an environmental problem that should be subject to regulation, um, I would hope that we would come to an agreement that all of this excess and wasted light at night is a source of pollution that should be subject to reasonable controls. That's what Assemblymember Lee was trying to work on with his bill earlier this, uh, this year. 
Uh, and I think that idea is gradually making its way into the world of policy and law. And eventually we will see um, more broad application of meaningful regulations that will reduce light pollution just as we have environmental laws that have meaningfully reduced, for example, air and water pollution. We need comprehensive um, plans for outdoor lighting everywhere. The picture here is meant to suggest uh, setting up a system of zoning that would be an overlay on land use zones in typical cities where lighting allowances would scale according to actual needs. This makes it simple to follow a prescription when you're developing um, new projects on uh, different lands in, in our cities. We could develop them in ways that are sensitive to the environment but make sure that we give people all the light that they need uh, so that they can be safe to get around at night. This will be beneficial to our urban wildlife to the human population of our cities. Um, and we think that they just look better when this is done properly. We really do need a revision of international lighting standards, especially for urban settings that have a strong evidence basis. Uh, right now, we sort of make these rules by feel and we need more data to tell us what the correct lighting levels are so that we don't provide too little light or too much light. And lastly, my hope is that societies everywhere will resist this idea that we just need more and more light. We need to consume more of this resource all the time in order to have safe and comfortable cities to live in. And that instead more cities out there might someday look like this one here in my own home state of Arizona. This is Flagstaff in Northern Arizona with a population of about 75,000 people. And despite uh, that growth that they've experienced in the past decade, you can still stand in downtown uh, Flagstaff and look up and see the Milky Way in the sky at night. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I will hand it back to the organizers now and look forward to taking your questions a little bit later in the proceedings. Thank you so much, Dr. Barentine, for making that case for dark skies and for some pretty sensible ways for us to redesign our built environment to mitigate light pollution. This really sets the stage for the rest of our program.